This video is going to cover how to do dependent T and working through the six steps of hypothesis testing from the Nolan and Heinsohn statistics for behavioral sciences. It's our example here. We've got um, a researcher examining satisfaction, so one to five scale, with the old rec facilities and the new rec facilities. So old and new tends to be a really great dependent setup because I can write the old stuff and the new stuff and I can see if your ratings for the new stuff are better. Okay, so the responses are on the next slide and are students more satisfied? So I've got P less than 0.01 and let's do all the six steps. All right, here we go. So the first is the data. And so you'd set this up in SPSS where each one of these is their own line because remember each person is its own row and then I'd have old versus new. So in this study, clearly participants rated the old facilities and then they rated the new facilities. And we're trying to see if the new ones are better. <clears throat> so in the first step, all you, what you wanna do is list the assumptions. So is the DV scale? In this case, it's one of those Likert scales. So it runs one to five, which makes it interval, which means yes, it's at least a scale. So yes. <clears throat> Two, is there random selection? Probably not. It's probably a convenience sample, so no. But could we randomly assign? Now remember, this is not random assignment to groups, that's independent T, but can I flip the order of the questions. So can I ask you about the old facilities and then the next person ask about the new facilities first? And so remember that's called counterbalancing. So I can randomly assign you to a counterbalanced order. And then the last one is, um, <clears throat> is the population normal? I don't know. Um, and then N is definitely less than 30 so we can't assume that it's normal either. So I would say no. So we're doing okay, two checks and an X. Part of step two, which is also step one, usually is labeling the sample and the population. But in this case, what we're gonna do is label level one, not level L, here we go, level one, and level two. Because remember, we're comparing um, two different conditions to each other, two different levels to each other, rather, and so different groups of the IV. Right, so I've got, let's do old versus new. Well, hold on, let me see what I did over here. Oh, I did new on the other side. Right, so I did new and then I did old. <clears throat> and the DV is my ratings. Okay. And so you can put them in any, any order you want. This part doesn't matter. Because what we're actually doing is comparing if the difference between these levels is different than zero. So the null really is, is there a difference score? Maybe not there, is the difference score uh, equal to zero? Come back, what are you doing? Equal to zero or greater than zero or less than zero. So <clears throat> it's really taking new minus old and testing that against zero. But the easiest way to kind of set this up to think about it conceptually is that I want new to be greater than zero and I want the, uh, for the null hypothesis to be equal than or less, um, sorry, less than or equal to the old one. But remember like what the math is doing is testing the different scores. Okay, so we're gonna subtract. So why did I put new first? Well, I came over here and I looked at what I did for my hypothesis test. Now remember in dependent T, you can put them in any order so whatever order you pick here in step two, make sure you put them in in the same order. So I did new first because the greater than test is easier to me. Uh, and so make sure this piece right here matches the same order that you did it in here or you'll have um, reversed numbers. Now if you do a, a non-directional test, that doesn't matter because it, the order, um, we're doing positive and negative, so the order wouldn't matter. If you do a directional test, greater than or less than, it does matter. Okay, so that's step two. Step three can be gained all from this paired samples box. So you wanna make sure you're using the paired samples test box. So I'm gonna list the mean difference. And that's here. 
It just says mean, but it also says paired differences here where I've uh, covered it up. Here we go, paired differences. So this is telling you these are all the different scores. So the mean difference is 0.86. The standard deviation of the differences, which is different from um, independent t, is 1.07. And then the standard error of the differences is 0 0.40. Um, and remember that this formula is still going to be s difference over the square root of n. We haven't really changed the formula for standard error. <clears throat> and so we are assuming mu is 0. Okay, so we're testing if the mean difference here is different from 0, greater than 0 in this case, because we were interested in if nu is greater than old. So why did I do nu minus old? Well, if I do them in the same order, that means positive scores will be greater because that means the first number will be bigger. The other thing we'll need is n. So there were seven people in this study. All right, so let's go on to part of step three. If you don't understand what this mean difference score is, so we said the mean difference is 0.86. If you don't get what does that mean, question mark, question mark, Okay, what you can do is look at these scores. So the new scores are higher, gives us 3.86, the old score is 3.0. You don't want to use this box with independent t. Okay. Because it looks the same, and that implies that there are 14 people here, when really n is 7, and each person has been tested twice. And so I tend to tell people to ignore this box for this class because otherwise it gets confusing when you look at independent t that has a very similar box and really the only difference is the word that paired here and paired here. If you aren't paying attention you can get confused. So if you're not but if you're not sure just look at the means in this box to help you figure out which one's um, bigger. Okay. All right step four. So for step four we need degrees of freedom. Okay that's here it's still n minus one so that's six. And we we're going to work with 0.01. And then last but not least, we're doing a one-tailed greater test. That's what I set up in step two. Okay. So I'm going to go to my T table. I'm going to pick a one-tailed test over 0.01. I had six degrees of freedom. So it's 3.14. Okay. So I'm going to skip ahead a couple of slides here. Write out my cutoff score, it's positive, so this is our one-tailed positive test. So that means everything out here is reject, everything down here is fail. Okay, so we got 3.143, that's one. There we go. <clears throat> okay, so this is what we're setting up. This is the finish line. Draw a little flag here. I can't draw the checkered flag, but that's the finish line. Let's see how far our little car got. So that's step five. So step five is where you find T found or T actual, or T study, however you want to think about it. It's here under T. So I got 2.12. And that's going to be here. So our little car only made it to here and then died. So we would fail to reject the null. Because we did not get far enough to uh, say that they are statistically different or statistically greater. Okay. So what about confidence intervals and effect sizes? Well, the cool thing about paired sample t is that you can get the confidence interval right here. So remember that the confidence interval needs to be around the point estimate, which in this case is mean difference. Okay. So it would be mean diff plus and minus t critical, and not step five, t critical here, times standard error of the differences. Okay. So in here, all I would have to do is fill in 0.86 for the mean difference, uh, 0.40 for the standard error of the differences, but the real trouble is that I would have to look up t critical, which I back up here Oop, to this slide. So I would have to do that as a one-tail test for confidence intervals. I'm sorry, a two-tail test. I said that wrong. And I would still use six degrees of freedom. Oh, 
It's in the wrong place. Let's try again. There we go. So it'd be 3.71. Okay, so you could go through all that trouble and do all that math, or you can look right here at the confidence interval. But if you only get the raw, uh, the calculated numbers, and you don't have um, the the real numbers to plug into SPSS, this is how you calculate it. But here's the trick: when you're running this in SPSS, be sure you change the confidence interval level if you're doing a 0.01 test to 99. If you are doing, you know, your traditional 0.05 test, that's the default. If you forget to change it, it will give you a 95% confidence interval, which will be incorrect. So make sure that this number here matches your test that you did in step four. Okay. All right, so that is how you do confidence interval. It's actually pretty easy. Just make sure you get the right number here. Now effect size. So the effect size, now when you do this in moat, be sure you're doing um, D, oops, D differences. So mode has two options for dependent T, and um, that gets into a lot of theory about effect sizes, but the traditional one that you're taught in this class is D difference. Okay. And so all you have to enter is the mean difference, the standard deviation of the difference, and N. It will auto-calculate this number for you, and all these numbers. Pin is possessed. Here we go, these numbers for you. Um, and so you can make sure they match, so I got 2.13, Back up one. Here's T, 2.12. It's pretty close. So be sure you enter mean difference, standard deviation difference, and N. So Cohen's D is technically mean diff over um, uh, SD diff. So standard deviation of the differences, not standard error. Because okay. T is technically mean difference over standard deviation of the differences, the standard error, sorry, of the differences, so SM. <clears throat> and so A would be, uh, here we go, 0.86 over 0 0.40, or point, good gracious, these two. So 0.86 divided by 107, and so I get a Cohen's D of 0 0.80, so that's large. So there's probably an effect, a difference between the old and new recreation facilities, because there's a large effect size but we don't have enough power to detect it because we only asked seven people. So we should be asking more like 30 people so we can assume normality and we would get a more stable answer. <clears throat> if I look at the confidence interval, it does cross zero. So the thing about interpreting confidence intervals in this section is you're always asking yourself if the, if the difference score confidence interval, that's what this is, crosses zero. If it crosses zero, then it is not, usually not statistically significant. <clears throat> All right, that's the first example. Let's do one more. So, should I change the disposal fees for waste services? So this happens a lot, where prices go up, but you might lose customers um, if prices go up. But really, this kind of company is kind of concerned, if I, if I increase prices, can I reduce waste? Because if we increase the price, people want to, don't want to pay per bag, and so they'll use less waste. This is more of an environmental question. So anytime you see before and after, that is a big clue that it's a dependent t-test. Okay. So a significant reduction in waste would relieve, typo, their trash truck drivers. Okay. So should they increase that fee at 0.05? <clears throat> so we have measured before, we've increased the fee, we're measuring after, and we're going to see what's happening. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. So here's the data if you want to enter it yourself and um, run this test in SPSS. Okay, so remember each person gets their own line. And so there'll be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight lines. So N is eight. So even though you have 16 scores, remember there's only eight people in this study. So let's write out our assumptions. Is the DV scale? Oh yeah, it's ratio, because it could have zero bags of trash. So that's a yes. All right, so here's the DV scale. Uh, what's the second one? Uh, random selection. Now, they haven't told me how they picked these people, but considering they're their own company, I could randomly select from my database. So they didn't tell me if they, if they did or not, but I could do random selection. Now, in this study, I couldn't do random assignment because I can't make before come second. 
is it normal? I have no idea. N is less than 30, so I can't assume that it's normal. But that's a check. There we go. <clears throat> okay. So this first one, remember, should always be true or you're doing the wrong type of test. These two we would prefer to be true to make sure that our test gives us the numbers that we would expect. So the numbers are reliable because if they're not true, they're a little less um, accurate. Step two, let's label level one and level two. I am almost positive that I put after first because that makes more sense to me. And then before, you can do it the other way, it doesn't matter. After, that's a T. Before, and our DV is bags of trash. Okay, so this is before and after a price increase. So it's really about after the price increase, before the price increase. So my research might know, I am expecting the number of trash bags to go down. I want them to decrease. So this is a less than test. And then I could, um, I, if our null is true, the price, the trash bags would have gone up or stayed the same. Okay. So we're gonna go P less than 0.05 for a less than test. And yes, that's what I did. So level one here, level two. In step three, we wanna label the mean difference, negative 1.25. We wanna label the standard deviation of the difference as part of Cohen's D's, 2.25. The standard error of the difference, which is 0 0.80. And N, which I already told you was eight. We are assuming that mu is zero. So pretty much everything comes from right here, except N, you just kinda of gotta know that one. Or you can remember that degrees of freedom is N plus one. I'm sorry, in minus one, so it would be df plus one. All right, if I didn't understand what negative 1.25 meant, so remember mean difference was negative 1.25. I'm like, ah, what does that mean? If I look at the numbers here under mean, I can tell that after is, below, is less than before. So a negative number is what I want. I want a less than test, and it should be negative. So let's see if this negative number is less than zero statistically, because this would be the research. Uh, the null is that this number is greater than or equal to zero. Probably not greater than, but definitely could be statistically equal to zero. Okay. <clears throat> All right, step four is my uh, cutoff score or critical. That was fun, let's try that again. There we go. Or you can call this your cutoff. This is how far the little car has to go. And so we have seven degrees of freedom. We're using P less than 0.05 and a one-tailed uh, less than test. So I'm gonna go over here to my T table, Ooh, my invisible T table. Okay, I didn't cut and paste it apparently, so let's back up to that other one. Whoop, whoop, there it was. All right. <laughs> So I'm using 0.05, a one-tailed test, 0.05, and I had seven degrees of freedom, do do do, so it's 1.895. Sorry about that. Okay, so T is gonna be negative 1.895. Okay, remember that it's a less than test, so it needs to be negative here. So I'm gonna go over here to step six, and write that down. So this is where I gotta go out here. It's negative 1.895. This is reject out here. <clears throat> this is fail over here. Now let's see how far we actually got. So that's step five. So here's T. Remember that T is mean diff. So here, this one, divided by standard error difference scores, this one. So it would be 1.25 over 0.8, which is negative 1.57, that's not good. Anything close to one is never <clears throat> probably gonna reject. So we're here, negative 1.57, so we would fail to reject. Boo! All right. So I don't know if the trash bags decreased the, <clears throat> I'm sorry, if the price increase decreased the number of trash bags. And so what I could do is calculate the confidence interval. So remember that's here. 
So lower would be negative 3.13, so a reduction of three bags of trash. And the upper is actually across zero, so that's why we wouldn't reject. And it's almost one bag of trash more. They're paying more money. Oh, no. And so this is a 95% confidence interval because we used 0.05. Now, let's see what the effect size is and see if maybe I just need to run more people. Like, if this is a large effect, then we're missing it by only running eight people. So remember, you got to enter the mean difference, the standard deviation of the difference, and N. For this to work, it will calculate all the numbers for you, but you can check and make sure you have the right T value. So 1.57, and we do 1.57. And then D here is 0.56. Okay, is it D? Okay, so this number here. Remember, use Cohen's D, not the lower and the upper, right? And so that is a, a medium effect size. And so if we're just trying to reduce trash, a medium effect size is a pretty good deal. Because remember, there have the, all the aspirin studies and the seatbelt studies that show that it wasn't statistically significant, but it was practically pretty important. So I think a medium effect size indicates that practically it's probably important. Um, that the number of trash bags are going down, so people are doing less waste, which is always good. Okay. And so all of that is confidence intervals, effect size, and the hypothesis testing steps for dependent T.